Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us today for the distinguished public lecture on the theme, Why is Independence of Judiciary Important in a Democracy? Today's lecture has been organized by OP Jindal Global University and the Singhvi Endowment and is in collaboration with the Singhvi Trinity Scholarship Award, established by Dr. Abhishek Manu Singhvi at the Trinity College, University of Cambridge. I extend a very warm welcome to our distinguished guests and members of the audience who have joined us today. I am pleased to welcome our chief guest for this evening, Honorable Mr. Justice P.S. Narasimha, Judge Supreme Court of India. And our guest of honor, His Excellency Mr. Alex Ellis, British High Commissioner to India, and Mr. Michael Halgate, Deputy Director India, British Council. I'm also delighted to welcome Dr. Abhishek Manusinghi, Senior Advocate, Supreme Court of India and Member of Parliament, Rajya Sabha. Welcome and thank you for joining us today. I'm so delighted to welcome Mr. Naveen Jindal, Chancellor, OP Jindal Global University and members of the Jindal family. Welcome and thank you for joining us today. To begin with, I invite Professor Dr. C. Rajkumar, Founding Vice Chancellor, OP Jindal Global University, to please present the welcome address. A very good evening to all of you. I would like to extend a warm welcome to our distinguished Chief Guest, Honorable Mr. Justice Narshima, of course, our uh, British High Commissioner, the Deputy Director of the British Council, um, very distinguished uh, judges of the Delhi High Court, former title Supreme Court Justice Sikri, um, also our distinguished Chancellor, Mr. Jindal and the members of uh, Dr. Abhishek Manusinghi's family, those who instituted this endowment, other distinguished lawyers, members of parliament, uh, judges of the High Court, former judges, um, and ladies and gentlemen. It's indeed my proud privilege to welcome all of you to this very special evening when we will be celebrating the philanthropic contribution of Dr. Singhvi, but also to celebrate the recipient of this scholarship and also to have a distinguished public lecture by a truly remarkable Judge, a jurist, uh, Justice Narasimha. At the outset, I want to uh, especially thank all the members of the legal community uh, because uh, the Supreme Court of India opened after a vacation. Uh, it just began yesterday and it's a working day today. All of you have chosen to be here despite your many other preoccupations, so I deeply appreciate your presence. Uh, this facility is also a very important part of our endeavor to connect with the legal community as well as with the wider public intellectual community in Delhi and beyond. Uh, the JGU International Academy that has been set up here is part of an effort to provide opportunities for intellectually engaging discussions. Uh, it was inaugurated by the Honorable Mr. Justice Suryakant just um, on 20th of May along with the distinguished presence of our Attorney General and Sol Sindhu, both of whom are present here and I am grateful to them for their presence and also their participation in this event today. Uh, I also want to quickly mention that uh, the opportunity to celebrate philanthropy is uh, deeply uh, connected between the destinies of both these efforts. Uh, the fact that uh, OP Jindal Global University is hosting and was established to a philanthropic endeavor of our founding chancellor, Mr. Jindal, and uh, today's endowment uh, that Dr. Singhvi has established at Trinity College in many ways connects because of two very interesting reasons. One, of course, that Dr. Abhishek Manu Singhvi has also established an endowment at the Global University and the Global Law School. But more interestingly, today's recipient of this scholarship happens to be a Jindal Global Law School student and a graduate of JGLS from this college. Now, this is purely coincidental because uh, there are 1,700 law schools in India and every year this endowment envisages one student of law from any of Indian law schools to be selected and be given the scholarship to study at the Trinity College, College University of Cambridge. It so happened that this year's recipient is the graduate of General Global Law School, is currently in the final year, and I am doubly happy that we are going to be having this award uh, celebrated in front of all of you. I also want to recognize the contribution of uh, Dr. Vishayk Manusigvi, not only in relation to these two scholarships 
that is established both at the University of Cambridge and at Opie Jindal Global University, but also other uh, public endeavors in relation to scholarships as well as other uh, philanthropic contributions and charitable contributions, both as a member of parliament as well as a public uh, intellectual. Uh, but I am particularly grateful to him, not only because of these uh, financial endeavors that he has made contribution to, but he's also been a distinguished professor at Jindal Global Law School, taught a full-fledged course, and um, didn't charge a pie for that, and that's quite unlikely for a senior counsel like him. We got his time, which I believe is more precious and priceless, and I am truly grateful to him as he led himself as a member of the bar to give time and to actually inspire many young students. Since many of you are present here today, I want you to follow the footsteps of Dr. Vishay Singhvi and offer courses and inspire our students as a part of your effort to contribute towards the legal community. I also want to quickly mention that uh, this effort that has been possible is because of an important commitment towards uh, building excellence in higher education and legal education. Uh, Trinity College, University of Cambridge is also the alma mater of uh, uh, Dr. Abhishek Singhvi. He spent several years as an undergraduate student, as a master's student and as a PhD student there and it's a tribute to him to give it back. Uh, there are fantastic examples in India and around the world. I know that our own Chancellor Mr. Jindal uh, endured the Naveen Jindal School of Management at the University of Texas, Dallas, besides, of course, enrolling this university itself. So these are very interesting parallels as well as contributions that uh, individuals uh, have made. And here, I want to especially thank Dr. Singhvi for being a leader in the legal profession to make this contribution. I want to stop here and thank the presence of each one of you. I'm not able to take the names of all of you, but the fact that we have the leaders of the litigating bar uh, the leaders of the transactional bar, I see Cyril Shroff uh, present here. Again, uh, devoting his uh, unbillable hours uh, to be present <laughs> here, um, supporting in this endeavor, makes a huge uh, source of encouragement and inspiration for all of us here. So I want to especially thank you for your presence. I want to uh, thank my wife, Pratiba, who lets me do all these things and uh, takes care of so many other things when I'm doing these things. So thank you, Pratiba, for your presence here. I also want to thank uh, the presence of Anita Simiji, uh, who is also here. Again, a great source of inspiration for all of us. With those words, I want to stop here and let's continue with the program. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for such a pleasant welcome. I am pleased to invite our guest of honor, Mr. Michael Holgate, Deputy Director, India, British Council, to please address the audience. Um, thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. So I have to say I'm feeling a little bit like an outsider here because I'm probably one of the few people in the room who's not involved in the legal profession in any way. I don't have any background in law. Congratulations. Um, <laughs> I will um, say a little bit about the, um, you know, the wider UK-India education relationship, which of course this scholarship is an important part of. Um, it's, it's an enormous honor and a privilege to be able to speak in front of such a, you know, an esteemed uh, uh, audience of people. And thank you so much to the, uh, you know, the Honorable Mr. Justice for joining us and, and everyone who's taking the time to be here. <laughs> Um, thank you so much to, to Dr. Singhvi and to uh, Trinity College Cambridge for making the scholarship possible. And of course, thanks to, to Dr. Raj Kumar. Sorry. And, um, and to all the team at OP Jindal for, for making this, uh, the event possible as well. Uh, it's really great to see this scholarship uh, achieving such great impact. So, uh, as I say, I don't work in law at all. I work at the British Council here in Delhi. And the British Council's job is really to support the development and the growth of the education and cultural relationship between India and the UK. Uh, so we try to help young people and academics from the UK and India to connect with each other uh, and to connect with new knowledge and new opportunity. We often say uh, within the British Council that there's really never been a better time uh, to be doing the work that we're trying to do. Uh, in many ways, when it comes to the UK-India educational relationship, uh, over the past couple of years, we've really seen the stars starting to align. So on the UK side, we've seen a higher education sector uh, emerging from the pandemic, post-Brexit, really beginning to look to India 
as the most important new partner for educational partnerships for the next few decades. Um, and on the India side, we've seen the release of the, the new national education policy a couple of years ago, which has an explicit focus on educational internationalization uh, and also incredible ambitions to achieve massive growth in the HE sector over the next coming years. So these two trends are really coming together to ensure that education uh, becomes an increasingly important part of the UK-India relationship across all levels. So at the, at the government level, uh, the UK and India are working together uh, on education to try to reduce market barriers to support uh, education institutions to be able to work together more easily. So most notably, last year we had an agreement on the mutual recognition of qualifications that will make partnerships like this scholarship much more easy to, uh, to set up in coming years. At the institutional level, we see record numbers of universities from India and the UK working together on research partnerships, on transnational education partnerships, joint courses, uh, on scholarships like this one, uh, and on industrial collaborations, um, record numbers of these institutional partnerships. And then, of course, at the individual level, we're seeing record numbers of young people traveling between our countries in both directions, trying to gain the new perspectives uh, and the new outlooks that come from studying in a different country. Uh, and scholarships such as the one uh, that we're celebrating here today are scholarships that provide young Indians with the opportunity to benefit from the very best of UK education uh, are a really, really important part of this story. Uh, so with that, I'd just like to commend everybody involved uh, in making this scholarship into a reality. A uh, huge congratulations to all of the alumni in this prestigious program. Uh, I'd like to you know, really hope to see in the future more and more Indians benefiting from this uh, and similar programs. And let me end just by saying thank you uh, again to everyone involved. Thank you to Dr. Singhvi, uh, to Trinity College Cambridge. Thank you so much to, to Ovi Jindal. Uh, thank you all and hope you have a good rest of the evening. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Dalvej. I now welcome Dr. Abhishek Manasinghvi, Senior Advocate, Supreme Court of India and Member of Parliament, Rajya Sabha, to please share his reflections on the scholarship and the speaker. Welcome, sir. Honorable Mr. Justice uh, Narsimha, a recent defector from amidst us, Excellency British High Commissioner, by the one of the most remarkably informal dim diplomats, and we were discussing in the other room whether protocol requires Excellency, the one person who wouldn't want that word to be used for him, this High Commissioner, but it is mandatory attached to his name. Mr. Holget from the British Council, Vice Chancellor Rajkumar, for whom for the last few Months I have coined a new word, the extortionist. <laughs> <laughs> and I find my friend Naveen Jindal nodding his head in that way. <laughs> attorney. That's what I'm saying, he's nodding in vigorous again. All sides. <laughs> attorney General for India, Solicitor General, distinguished judges of the High Court, senior advocates, members of parliament. My colleagues at the bar, a lot of unbelievable hours there. <laughs> uh, Avishkar, Singhvi, ladies and gentlemen. I am happy. And of course, <laughs> I was actually sticking to the legal community, not the illegal one. <laughs> I am happy to welcome you to this delightful confluence. This auspicious Triveni Sangam of scholarship intersecting with the vital theme of judicial independence. The first being commemorated and the second being addressed by the symbol of excellence from the bar, our very own Mr. Justice Narsimha. Turning first to the last angle of this triangle, as I said, if defections could ever taste sweet and not be a constitutional sin, as repeatedly described by the Supreme Court, it would be in the defection of the best and the brightest to the apex court. Most recently epitomized by the appointments of Justice Narsimha and Justice Vishwanathan. 
and the collegium chooses wisely they choose well and you never hear words other than those of the deepest appreciation for such choices incidentally this is also a core aspect core component of judicial independence and if only such choices were repeated more and more in all other judicial appointments most of the criticisms and laments would die it is clearly a yes we can moment for the collegium justice narsimha has traveled far and wide and remember the best is yet to come on this side of the bar i have been witness to his indefatigable industry his utter sincerity and commitment to the brief and his unfailing courtesy in all situations it was always accompanied by this voracious non slp reading and hardly a week passed when he was in the bar when he did not suggest some new and innovative reading material to me and i must sadly confess i could hardly keep up with that reading list his forensic skill and industry shone not only in cases like the bcci and the ayodhya case but also when he represented india in an international tribunal in the italian marines case in his relatively short stint on the bench he is already displaying the same traits from holding that compassionate appointments denied to children born from the second wife of a deceased employee that being discriminatory <coughs> to the ruling that power under section 319 of the crpc should be exercised only when there is strong and cogent evident evidence existing not in a casual and cavalier manner to the conclusion that even a strong recommendation by an officer of the department does not give any indefeasible right to promotion and so on justice narsimha has thus stood up for the underdog given teleological meaning and content to sterile statutory language and displayed his versatility his ready acceptance to be here on a working day reflects his commitment to the basic values reflected in this remaining <laughs> friends it is tried to say with the second angle of this triangle that democracy is not merely a system of governance but a broader social commitment that values equality fairness and justice and it is the judiciary in its independent capacity that breathes life into these values an independent judiciary serves as a neutral referee resolving conflicts not based on the might of the parties involved but on the might of the law on a personal note my father once told me that of his many and diverse academic endeavors he found perhaps the most enjoyable and vital his work as the united nations special rapporteur on the independence of judges in the 1970s and the quebec conference in canada which absorbed his report into un literature and did it the honor by coining the phrase singvi principles was as much for the emerging significance of the subject as for his scholarship <clears throat> it is truly the lifeblood of our democracy it ensures accountability promotes transparency guards our fundamental rights and upholds the principle of justice for all an independent judiciary is clearly the crown jewel of our constitutional republic with guardians like justice narsimha we can sleep safely as far as this vital value is concerned wherever this diminishes and that it diminishes we all know it does democracy diminishes and trust that most eternal bedrock on which the judiciary survives also diminishes the third part of this triangle the scholarship endowed by me takes me down memory lane to the extraordinary experiences i had in different capacities at my foreign alma mater trinity college cambridge which i entered as an undergraduate and left with a phd indeed this last month june when the master of trinity in typical english style she still called master despite being the first woman in 700 years be appointed as principal of my college and she told me that she insisted that she continues to be called master <laughs> it reminded me of the dedication such institutions have to excellence 
This endowment is a recognition of the academic excellence of our recipients and also celebrates their relentless pursuit of knowledge. Their unwavering, their unwavering commitment and their incredible resilience in the face of challenges. In a sense, it is a vote of confidence, an affirmation of potential, a recognition of hard work and a commitment to nurturing talent. It seeks to bridge the gap between dreams and reality, enabling those who strive to excel, who yearn to learn and do so without the burden of financial constraints. It is in that sense an investment in human potential, a catalyst for personal and societal progress. The recipients of these awards, by the way, now four years old. We've had three in four years. One dropped off. Uh, this is the fourth one. Are exceptional individuals who have demonstrated academic excellence, leadership potential, and a commitment to making a positive impact in their communities. Their journeys punctuated by dedication, perseverance, and tenacity inspire us all. This scholarship is certainly not the end for them, rather a beginning, a launch pad that propels them towards greater heights. It is a challenge to the recipients not to rest on their laurels, but to see this as a stepping stone to even greater achievements. Friends, it is truly wonderful to have such an eclectic gathering to commemorate the scholarship and to discuss this vital theme. And I must, from the bottom of my heart, thank you for all those unbelievable hours you have devoted. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Singhvi. It's always such a pleasure to listen to you. I'm now pleased to invite our guest of honor, His Excellency, Mr. Alex Ellis, British High Commissioner to India, to please address the audience. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, good evening to you all. Um, I uh, thank you, Dr. Singh, for well, giving me the chance to, to to stop and think for a second about the rule of law. Um, I my qualifications for coming here, I think, are, are, are threefold. One uh, is that um, I know remarkably little about the law, um, and would have been a and my elder sister, eldest sister, who is a lawyer, said to me about two years ago as we were going through some legal documents, at the end of which she looked at me and she said, you would have made a terrible lawyer. <laughs> I'm afraid I wear that as a badge of honor in the case of my elder sister. Uh, the second is that my wife is that most unusual thing in that game. She is an amateur judge. She is a magistrate, so she sits in court. Um, it's a wonderful thing about the British legal system that the magistrates courts uh, amateurs in the sense that they are chosen from the wider body, which is, I guess, <laughs> once upon a time, very much the traditional way in which justice was dispensed, uh, not through professionals, but through people who understood the community. Secondly, that she's Portuguese, um, and no one's ever asked her nationality when she sits in court. Uh, it's completely immaterial. She says, of all the things she's done in her life, it's the thing that she has most enjoyed. Um, and I think that the pleasure which she gets from being a judge, she says, is just like no, no other kind of uh, intellectual activity which she's done in her life. Um, and it's really nice to speak in front of some friends. I to thank you so much, uh, Professor Harshan Kumar, for giving me the opportunity to go to a magnificent uh, university. And congratulations, sir. It's a great thing you did there, I must say. Uh, to start an institution which can last, I think, is a truly admirable act for any public citizen in any country. So. Congratulations for that. Um, and I, uh, so I was just thinking, well, first, the law and the UK and India, and Prime Minister Modi likes to talk about the living bridge, and the living bridge, the legal living bridge, is very strong. I see some of you here this evening who know it were well, very much part of it. It's historic. Um, I like to think that uh, the British legal system contributed in a small way to the independence of India. Uh, through some of the founders of uh, modern India and the way in which they thought about the Constitution in particular. Um, uh, I don't think that legal education in the United Kingdom realized that at the time, but there are some <laughs> positive externalities to everything that happens in life. Um, the, bridge legal, the, the sort of legal living bridge between uh, Cambridge, between Trinity College and India is, of course, very strong, starting with the first Prime Minister of modern India, uh, who read natural sciences, I think, 
that night. Um, uh, and of course, the Cambridge India legal bridge is very strong. The 11th and 15th Chief Justice of India studied at Trinity College. I think I'm right in saying so. It's incredibly distinguished. Um, and I'm very warm to the 15th. And you, you all know much better than me. I obviously never met Mirza Hamidullah Beg because he read archaeology and anthropology, which I think is an excellent way to start your legal career. <laughs> if you'll excuse me for saying so, what do they know of law, of law who only law know? Uh, the sense of having the wider sense of life and of studies, I think, is incredibly important. I think one of the things which you aspire to in the university is to give that broader sense. Um, I'm delighted for all the extracurricular reading which Judge is, 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 uh, is suggesting to other people. Was the second Attorney General of uh, India, C.K. Daftari, and uh, another one of the most distinguished ones, Milan Banerjee, also studied at Cambridge. There's a great deep link there. So why is that? Why is it that we find the depth of this link? And I think, firstly, it's language. And uh, the commonality of language and of concepts uh, between India and the United Kingdom. I was, I would like to say rereading, but I think probably reading properly for the first time a passage to India uh, on holiday last month, the central scene of which, no, it's not surprisingly captured by, on, on, in, in the film, is the court scene, um, if you remember the court scene. And it's a magnificent example of how the rule of law can overcome power uh, and, and how due process actually challenges power. Uh, and it was, I, well, it's, a, it's one of the most wonderful scenes I think I've read in a very, very long time, that scene beautifully described how power collapses before law if justice is applied properly. Um, the second is, for the bridge, I think, is the outstanding talent of India. I often say India, like my country, has its issues, its ups and downs, but an absence of human talent will never be a problem in India. A remarkable privilege. And that talent, of course, now going, of course, through the scholarship as many other ways. The third Please excuse the immodesty. There's a great expression in Portuguese which says to pull the barbecue coal to your sardine. Um, and I'm going to do that now um, because uh, we have in the United Kingdom some absolutely outstanding educational institutions. Trinity College is an example of that. Cambridge University, where I studied, is an example of that, where excellence is global excellence, and they are globally excellent institutions. Um, the fourth, I think, is the offer. So, through this scholarship, in the uh, Dr. Zimby and uh, Trinity College. Through many other ways, we have uh, government, British government scholarships. A lot of Indian laws go on those, and there uh, are actually 166 alumni under the achieving scholarship we have. So there is an offer there. And finally, I would hope that beyond the language, the talent, the institutions, the offer is a shared sense of the importance of the rule of law as a fundamental aspect of any civilized society. Now, in my view, law is a way, not an end. It is a way of managing the interaction between human beings in all their different forms. But it is an absolutely fundamental way. One thing I have learned that every country I have lived in, I've lived in a lot of countries where things really work, where things really advance, is when the rule of law is at the bottom of everything. It is respected, and people know it as well, because it has a tremendously positive effect, I think, in terms of the rule of law. And um, you don't have to be Judge Das or Dr. Aziz from there. Uh, passage to India to know that. Um, there's a future to this. A future will be in the next generation, the scholars who go on your scholarship, sir. Uh, the scholars who will go elsewhere as well. The scholars who will come to the Jindal University as well. Um, we in the UK, we have quite a lot to learn, I think, from the Indian system. For example, we are very interested in what you're doing on digitization. Um, we think there's a lot we can learn from you as we try to adapt our own legal system. So I'd like to think that this is going to be a two-way flow. So thank you very much for giving me the chance to, first of all, to listen to you, sir, Judge Nassim. I'm looking forward to that. Um, uh, secondly, I'm trying to swerve past that most generous of insults to say I'm remarkably informal, which in diplomatic language is about as rude as you could get about a diplomat. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I dare tell my, my, my boss, who's actually coming here tomorrow, that I've been called remarkably informal. <laughs> And let me make one final request to you. One of my aims, and we're doing, I'm doing this with Michael and, and with the British Council's eyes, there's a lot of Indian knowledge about the UK. I think there isn't enough UK and British knowledge about India. And I would like to get 10,000 young Brits between the ages of 18 and 30 to come to India each year for between four weeks, six weeks, maybe in three months, to understand the reality of modern India. Um, and so I invite you, as we've already discussed, uh, I invite you to help me to do that.
uh, by offering opportunities for young talented Brits to come to India because I think there's a very sort of folkloric and backwards looking description, depiction of India in the United Kingdom. And I think there's a much more exciting modern today and tomorrow about India. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, His Excellency, and we look forward to welcoming the youth of United Kingdom in India very soon. I am delighted to announce the recipient of the Singhvi Trinity Scholarship Award, Mr. Jay Brunner from Jindal Global Law School. at the University of Chicago, where he focused on political philosophy. In 2020, he was admitted to Jindal Global Law School's three-year LLB program. Outside of the classroom, Jay has had the opportunity to carry out research on issues relating to due process. In addition, he has interned under Chief Justice of India, Honorable Dr. Justice D.Y. Chandrachu. Jay has been awarded the Trinity Singhvi Scholarship for pursuing his Master of Laws degree at the University of Cambridge. I invite our chief guest, guests of honor, Dr. Abhishek Manu Singhvi and Professor Dr. C. Raj Kumar to please present the Singhvi Trinity Scholarship Award instituted at the Trinity College, University of Cambridge to Jay. Jay, I request you to please share your remarks thereafter. Okay. Well, it is a, it's a great honor to be here today. Uh, thank you, Honorable Mr. Justice P.S. Narasimha, Senior Advocate Dr. Abhishek Manu Singhvi, Chancellor Mr. Naveen Jindal, Dr. C. Raj Kumar, Solicitor General, Attorney General. I've never been, to be honest, I've never been uh, in a room with so many dignitaries, so it's, I'm quite nervous, um, His Excellency. Um, I'm extremely honored and, and humbled to be receiving uh, the Dr. L.M. Singhvi Trinity Scholarship. Of course, receiving any scholarship is a matter of great pride, but the Singhvi Trinity carries special meaning for me uh, for two reasons. The first has to do with Dr. Abhishek Manu Singhvi's father, the great Dr. L.M. Singhvi, after whom the scholarship uh, is named. So as many of you know, Dr. L.M. Singhvi was uh, head of the High Level Committee on the Indian Diaspora in the early 2000s and recommended creating overseas citizen uh, of India status. He had a vision of a globalized India where the Indian diaspora catalyzed foreign investment, technology and knowledge transfer, etc. And he spoke of building a bridge between India and the rest of the world. I, in some ways, I feel he had me in mind. Um, my mother, who is here today, uh, is Indian. <laughs> my mother is Indian, but as you can probably tell, my, my father is foreign, so I'm, I'm a mix. And I, so in that sense, I feel you know, honored that the, that the scholarship is being awarded to me. Um, I completed my undergraduate degree from the University of Chicago. I returned to India to work and then pursued law from Jindal Global University. And I hope to contribute to building this bridge um, that Dr. L.M. Singhvi envisioned by returning again. And the second reason that this scholarship carries so much meaning for me is that my grandfather went to Cambridge. My maternal grandfather, Dr. S. Chandrasekhar, was a, a doctoral student in physics at Pembroke. And he came from a line of brilliant scientists. His uncle was Sir C. V. Raman. His cousin was Dr. Subramanian Chandrasekhar both Nobel laureates. Uh, yeah. <laughs> think, no pressure. Yeah. I, I'm obviously not going to fill their shoes, but what I, I think what I draw the most inspiration from is that he chose to return to India, and he did his pioneering work here on liquid crystals and established three research centers. So I, too, hope to return and contribute to institution building. And I draw great inspiration from uh, Chancellor Mr. Naveen Jindal and Dr. Siraj Kumar, because for what you've done, the phenomenal work you've done in building up Jindal, it's truly an extraordinary institution. Um, the access I had to world-class faculty, resources, they were equivalent to what I saw at the University of Chicago, and it's sometimes better. 
So really, I, I would not be going to Cambridge today were it not for the opportunities I was offered at Jindal. And I lastly, this is maybe perhaps my, my dream, is that I hope sometime in the near future, perhaps a young British student will be standing before you, thrilled to be receiving a scholarship to pursue a master's in law, perhaps from Jindal, and uh, chooses it over some premier institution, perhaps chooses it even over an Oxbridge. And I think, I believe personally, essential for this, since today we're speaking about judicial <coughs> independence, I think another form of autonomy that's very important is um, academic autonomy. And I think that if we want to see that, we need to continue having academic freedom that we see at Jindal, and hopefully we can replicate that in, in other public and private universities. So with that being said, thank you very much, Dr. Abhishek Manusinghvi, for this incredibly generous endowment. Um, it's really once time, once in a lifetime opportunity. I'd also like to thank uh, Jindal Global University for the opportunities I was offered. I would like to briefly also acknowledge Dr. Uh, Sudhir Krishnaswamy and Senior Advocate Jaina Kothari who introduced me to the law in Bangalore. And lastly, I'd like to thank, thank my parents, my mother, my father who couldn't be here today. Um, they've you've supported me in all my mistakes and my achievements. So thank you very much and thank you to my sister as well, Mia. Thank you and many congratulations, Jim. I now welcome our chief guest, Honorable Mr. Justice P.S. Narasimha, Judge Supreme Court of India, to please present the distinguished public lecture on the theme, Why is Independence of Judiciary Important in a Democracy? His Excellency, Alex Ellis, British High Commissioner, Dr. Singhvi, Member of Parliament and Senior Advocate, Professor Raj Kumar, Mr. Naveen Jindalji, Michael Bulgat, Attorney General, the Learned Solicitor General, many of my former colleagues at the bar, many senior advocates, friends. Good evening to you all. I am honored to be invited to deliver this distinguished public lecture by Dr. Singh Trinity Endowment and the OP Jindal Global University. I believe Dr. Singh Trinity scholarship was established by Dr. Singh in 2017 <coughs> to assist law students seeking to pursue masters in law in Trinity College. I quote from his earlier speech that through this scholarship, our students will receive international exposure and the opportunity to transform themselves into global leaders. This scholarship award will enable young, bright young Indians, students to receive <coughs> higher education despite issues of financial affordability. Charity in education, I remember my father telling me long back about how important it is and he related it to me in a aphorism, so to say, in Telugu. It says, Vidya avidya ku kevala krupa vidipurva kamuga prajalita muchayaga adi sakala dharitri dhanam kante adhikatarma ho. The act of uh, transfer of knowledge from those who have knowledge <coughs> to those who do not have the knowledge without consideration and that is Kevala Krupa, that is only for the purpose of Krupa, Vidipurva Kamuga, which means as an obligation to do it and Prajalita Muchega, meaning that in order to enable it to attain excellence, such a transfer is said to be exceeding the act of donating the entire earth. This is how I recognize the act of uh, Dr. Singhvi and his family, I must say, in instituting this uh, scholarship. And we have already begun to see how its effect is. 
after becoming a judge, I was told that I should only be reading from a written script, <laughs> <laughs> which I never used to do earlier. And um, why is independence of judiciary important to democracy? This is the topic for the lecture. Prima facie, the theme has, as I would uh, take it forward, has three core concepts to be discussed. The first is independence of judiciary, then the concept of democracy, and also how both these are interconnected. There are, of course, a uh, few other sub-themes inherent in the topic, which I shall be discussing in the course of this lecture. To also give an overview of my ideas, I shall first talk, talk about the conceptions of democracy and judicial independence are connected through the common thread of constitutionalism or end rule of law. Thereafter, I will discuss democracy and judicial independence are co-dependent on each other through the constitutional concept of separation of powers. I shall then discuss how framers of our Indian constitution envisaged independence of judiciary as in a post-colonial democratic constitution. And finally, I will also discuss few parameters on which we may examine the concept conception of judicial independence in a democracy. <clears throat> Professor M.P. Singh, who taught me in a way he was my guru, he defined, let, I'll commence with that, his definition of independence of judiciary. The independence of judiciary means and includes the independence of judiciary as a collective body or organ of the government from its two other organs as well as independence of each and every member of the judiciary, the judges, in performance of their role as judges. Without the former, the latter cannot be secured and without the latter, the former does not serve much purpose. Therefore, the two, even if separable, must be pursued together. A system which ignores one and the other cannot make much progress towards much less achieve the independence of judiciary. It is in this meaning that I reflect the conception of democracy and its connection with independence of judiciary. The common understanding of democracy as a rule of majority of the people the question is, but is democracy all about majority rule? Philosophers, political theorists and jurists have disagreed with this basic understanding of democracy. Democracy as a normative concept means certain values and frameworks need to be followed in a society which could give equal rights to all citizens. Celebrated philosopher John Dewey defined democracy as follows, democracy is a form of moral and spiritual association. This is so very different from what we understand. Democracy is a form of moral and spiritual association that recognizes the contribution that each member can make in his or her, her particular way to this ethical community. And each of us can contribute to this community. Dr. Ambedkar, who was his student, also reflected and gave more or less a similar definition of democracy as he understood. And he says, democracy is not merely a form of government. It is primarily a mode of associated living, a conjoint, communicated experience. It is essentially an attribute of respect and reverence towards our fellow men. I think it's... Uh, this thought which enabled uh, the formulation of our preamble. In my words, I think I should say the expression of John Dewey as well as Ambedkar, very well embedded in the preamble, where it says, it is fraternity assuring dignity. That I think sums up the definition of democracy rather than the matter of members and elections. Independence of judiciary therefore becomes a fundament, uh, foundational pillar for the intervening of democracy, constitutionalism and rule of law. 
Professor Bakshi, in his article titled Rule of Law in India, has observed that the Supreme Court of India, through its various judgments on public interest litigation cases, has developed the concept of rule of law by evolving, I quote, new social movement as aspiring to re-democratize the Indian state and governance. That is to say, an independent judiciary by promoting public interest energized the discourse on democracy and rule of law. In Swami, Justice Sikri, he is amongst us here, has very beautifully inter, uh, formulated the interrelationship between democracy, rule of law, and the role of judiciary in the following words. Look at it, so beautiful it is. I'm so happy that he's here. We are in an age of constitutional democracy, the too substantive and liberal democracy. Such a democracy is not based solely on the rule of people through their representatives, which is known as formal democracy. It also has other precepts like rule of law, human rights, independence of judiciary, separation of powers, etc. The framers of the Indian constitution and jury recognized the efforts at precepts of liberty, liberal and substantive democracy with rule of law as an important and fundamental pillar. At the same time, in the scheme of the constitution, it is the judiciary, that's the important part, in the scheme of the constitution, it's the judiciary which is assigned the role of upholding the rule of law and protecting the constitution and the democracy, unquote. The rule of law, which is the bedrock of democracy, will be adversely affected if the independence of judiciary is diluted. As Professor M.P. Singh rightly said, an independent judiciary is necessary for a free society and a constitutional democracy. It ensures the rule of law and realization of human rights and also the prosperity and stability of the society. Constitutionalism thus provides certain frameworks to preserve the ideals of democracy and rule of law. An independence of judiciary is one of the fundamental features of constitutionalism. With the advent of transformative constitutionalism, the concept of independence of judiciary ought not to be limited <coughs> amongst judges, lawyers, and law academicians, but it must be taught in schools of political science and philosophy and it's necessary for everybody to know. <laughs> the doctrine of separation of power has become a classic component of democracy and constitutionalism. That is, democratic form of government. Power shall not rest with only one arm of the government. It is the eminent French jurist Montesquieu who provided a comprehensive and a systematic formulation of doctrine of separation of powers in his book. The spirit of law in 1748, according to him, the separation of power entails distribution of authority amongst three distinct branches of government, the legislature, the executive, and the judiciary. And I quote his uh, observation in the spirit of law. This is very interesting. When the legislature, legislative and executive powers are united in the same person or in the same body or magistrate, there can be no liberty. Again, there is no liberty if the judicial power is not separated from the legislative and executive power. Were it joined in the legislative power, the life and liberty of the subject will be exposed to arbitrary control, for the judge would then become the legislator. Were it to join, were it joined with the executive power, the judge might behave with violence and oppression. There would be an end to everything where the same man or the same body to exercise these powers. This model ensures that no individual, that's the separation of power, ensures that no individual or body possesses all the three types of powers, thus preventing the concentration of authority and safeguarding against the risk of arbitrariness. In his article, Separation of Powers, John Fairlay noted that the Tripartite system of government authority was the result of a combination of historical experiences and the political theory generally as a fundamental maxim in a later part of the 18th century. The concept of separation of power 
has thus emerged as one of the most accepted principle on which any dynamic form of the government exists. Independence of judiciary is necessary to maintain separation of powers in the democratic system. If the independence of judiciary is compromised, then the conception of democracy itself comes to a threat. If the function of the judiciary is restricted, it dilutes the principle of separation of power. This has been underlined in the legal discourse in different countries. Louis Pasara, the lawyer and professor who had worked on the justice system in Peru, Argentina, Ecuador, Guatemala, has said, democracy requires judicial independence because it is before the courts that those who exercise power can be held constitutionally and legally accountable for their acts. However, only independent judges can exercise oversight over the acts of the government. If the judicial branch fails to reliably monitor whether government acts are in line with the constitution and the laws, its role is reduced to resolving conflicts between private individuals and the checks and balances among branches essential to democracy are devoid of complete content. An American judge has said judicial independence is most important in those cases where courts are called upon to resolve disputes between individuals in the state or between different branches of government. This, I will just digress uh, a little bit in a kind of a comparative uh, study of uh, independence of judiciary in the context of separation of powers as it existed in the West uh, with what it existed so far as in the eastern part of the country of the world is concerned. Where uh, there were no separation of powers, but power vested in one individual, that is the king perhaps, or whoever was the ruler. Francis Fukuyama, one of the greatest political writers, said that it is a concept that existed in India which we refer to regularly as a dharma concept, is a limitation where one would exercise the power with a restraint. So therefore there is no bifurcation, but the uh, control was self-imposed and it was exercised all through. But then the disadvantage was that if the king was ruthless, there was no alternate. That's the advantage that we, that uh, perhaps the world would take from the Western concept of separation of powers and also at the same time not leave out what was inherently existing that related to the restraint which was to be exercised from within as against from outside. This is a principle which perhaps we might develop over a period of time. I would refer to the present Chief Justice uh, reference to the basic postulate of our constitution. He said it is that every authority is subservient to the constitutional supremacy. No authority can assume to itself the ultimate power to decide the limits of its own constitutional mandate. Judicial review is intended to ensure that every constitutional authority keeps within the bounds of its constitutional function and authority. In holding a constitutional institution within its bound, judicial review does not trench upon the doctrine of separation of power. The adjudicatory powers vest in the Supreme Court as a constitutional court, judicial review does not traverse beyond the limits set by separation of power. In another judgment, which is uh, in Puttu Swami again, Justice Chandrachud has underlined the intrinsic connection between separation of power, rule of law and independence, which Justice Sikri has also noted. But now this is the difference here, where rule of law is the cornerstone of modern democratic societies and protects the fun foundational values of democracy. When the rule of law is interpreted as a principle of constitutionalism, it assumes a division of governmental powers or functions that inhibits the exercise of arbitrary state power. Separation of power supports the accountability aspect of rule of law, 
<coughs> separation of judicial and executive powers is an essential feature of the rule of law. But entrusting the power of judicial review to courts, the doctrine prevents government officials from having the last word on whether they have acted illegally. The separation of judicial power provides an effective check on executive branch. The concept of rule of law and separation of powers have been integral to the Indian constitutional discourse. Therefore, the independence of judiciary is an underlying value in the concept of separation of power is intrinsic to the protection of citizens' fundamental rights and their enforcement, encroachment by the state. In that sense, independence of judiciary is an invaluable tool, in, invisible tool, I'll put it like that. It is actually an invisible tool in the hands of citizens to ensure that their rights are safeguarded. Independence of judiciary is also, also brings in accountability in a democratic system. In Manoj Rarura versus Union, this court had, Supreme Court had held that the faith of the people is embedded in the root of the idea of good governance, which means reverence for citizen rights, respect for fundamental rights and statutory rights in any governmental action, difference in unwritten constitutional value, veneration for institutional <coughs> integrity and inculcation of accountability to the collective at large. By holding authorities accountable to their actions through judiciary, principle of democracy are reinforced and checks and balances are maintained to ensure rule of law and good governance. The existence of state power must be accompanied by accountability. Independence of judiciary is in that light essential to maintain the neutral and the ability of the judiciary to check excesses of the state action. We have to now see some of, uh, we might perhaps be wondering, this theoretical part of it is all right, but in its action or in its incorporation in the Constitution, has it been fully carried out or not? Constitutionalism, separation of powers can be made effective in a society. The answer lies in their entrenchment in the form of design and text of the Constitution. The framers of the constitution were well aware of the conscious, uh, conscious of concepts that I have mentioned. They envisaged a constitution which ought not to be democratic, but also enshrined the fundamental rights of the people and provided for institutions such as judiciary to protect citizens' rights and the basic tenets of democracy and constitutionalism. In the uh, famous book of Indian constitution, Cornerstone, of a nation, Randall Austin has said that our framers approach the establishment of fundamental rights and an independent judiciary with mm -hmm. utmost idealism, recognizing their crucial role in creating a society characterized by freedom, democracy, prosperity, and stability. And uh, when uh, we look at the discussion in the Constituent Assembly, I will. I have dealt with it here. When the, the Constitution of India was being framed, it was for the first time that Indians themselves were drafting the Constitution. The framers had experiences of the colonial regime, where executive excesses affected the freedom of citizen. Looking at the role of judiciary under the British rule, they were concerned about the limitations inherent in judiciary where the subordinate of the executive department where it is subordinated to the executive department of the government in that sense framers were conscious of the power structure and inequalities in the Indi in indian society which would require a neutral body to maintain the balance this experiences guided the framing of the provisions relating to judiciary dr ambedkar Replying in his reply to the draft provisions, said that there can be no difference of opinion in the House that our judiciary must both be independent of the executive and must be competent in itself. Dr. Rajendra Prasad also at the same time stated that we have provided in the Constitution for a judiciary which will be independent. It is difficult to suggest anything more to make the Supreme Court and the High Courts independent of the influence of the executive. 
there is an attempt made in the constitution to make even the lower judiciary independent of any outside or extraneous influence. K.T. Shah again was, he spoke uh, so much about independence of judiciary. It is not merely the separation of the judiciary from the executive, but also its independence which is of importance in democratic society. These words indicate that the independence of judiciary was of utmost importance in the constitutional design that was being prepared by the framers of the constitution. It is for this reason that the right to approach the Supreme Court of India against the violations of fundamental rights was enshrined in the same part three of the, as that the fundamental rights of the constitution of India. Now, so far as the separation of powers are concerned, even those were incorporated substantially but interestingly, the common understanding, misunderstanding is that the doctrine of separation of powers is not explicitly declared or formulated within the text of constitution. There are no grand proclamations or explicit terms like exclusive in reference to branches of government. However, the doctrine of separation of power between different organs of the state can be best understood from the words of B.K. Mukherjee in Ram Javaya, where he said that, Indian constitution was not indeed recognized the doctrine of separation of powers in the absolute rigidity, but the functions of different parts or branches of government have been sufficiently differentiated and consequently it can very well be said that our constitution does not contemplate assumption of one organ or part of a state of the functions that essentially belong to the other. Furthermore, a clear intent of the framers emerges to prevent the concentration of power within any single branch if we read the text of the various provisions. For instance, I think we can skip reading and referring to make it more legalized and uh, it emphasizes that such power can be exercised by the president in, a, in accordance with the constitution. That is so far as the executive power is concerned and uh, that exercise is subject to the constitution which brings in the clear differences that exist in the powers that one has to exercise with respect to executive, judiciary and the legislature. The framers further intended to prevent legislature from assuming roles beyond legislation and from exercising powers better suited for the other branches. Article 15 of the directive principles explicitly emphasizes the need of separating judiciary from the executive. There are very many other articles also, all of you are very well informed, I don't need to refer to them. And the constitutionalism applied and evolved the principle of uh, basic structure is yet another feature which clearly tells us uh, that the court has recognized the independence of judiciary and the role that it needs to perform. The decision emphasized the significance of preventing, uh, preserving the separation of power, independence of judiciary has been recognized as one of the basic features of the constitution which cannot be diluted. While the constitution primarily ensures the independence of judiciary, Additional measures such as legislation, conventions and practices also play a crucial role in ensuring independence of judiciary. It is also important to understand that the constitution or fundamental laws pertaining to judiciary merely serve as a starting point. True independence of judiciary relies on the creation of conducive atmosphere supported by all state organs. Thus, judiciary in India holds the expectation of independence as an integral part of the constitutional foundation. Despite their interconnection, each branch of government, as enshrined in our constitution, is designed to function independently. Role of judiciary goes beyond resolving disputes between individual groups. It also ensures justice in conflict involving individuals and state or against different states. Accomplishing these responsibilities necessitates an authoritative, independent and impartial judiciary. 
certain other parameters as I was indicating are necessary for me to deal to truly understand the real essence of independence of judiciary and its need. When one contemplates independence of judiciary, it ought to be visualized at two levels. Independence of judiciary in a narrow sense deals with independence and impartiality of individual judges in relation to appointment, tenure, payment of salaries and procedure for removal from their office. In a broader sense, at second level, the concept is about institutional independence of judiciary. But both levels have a commonality, which is the constitutional position entrusted to judiciary in a country. That is to say, the provision of the constitution must provide adequate functions as well as safeguards in the judiciary. As Valence noted, judicial independence at its basis means judges are free to rule against the government should the law be dictated without fear and favor. The threat of reprisal may also arise in nearly any case if political figures are corruptible to the extent that they will attempt to intervene on behalf of the powerful members of their constituencies. <coughs> Thus, the independence of judiciary from political pressure is an essential aspect of justice at any level. The Indian constitution, through its several provisions, ensures independence of judiciary. Amongst other features, the constitution entrenches the concept of judicial review, which plays a crucial role in upholding the independence of judiciary. It is well settled that independence of judiciary and judicial review are part of the basic structure or basic features of the Indian constitution. It is a power vested in the judiciary to review and assess the constitutionality and legality of laws, executive actions, and governmental policies. Judicial review serves as a check on the other, balance, other branches of government, ensures that their actions are in accordance with the constitution and protecting the rights and freedoms of individuals. Judicial review upholds constitutional supremacy, checks the balance of power and other branches of government, protects individual rights, safeguards rule of law, reinforces judicial independence. By exercising the power of judicial review, responsibility and impartiality, the judiciary plays a crucial role in upholding principles of justice, equality and rule, of, rule in a democratic society. The second parameter relates to the process of appointment of judges. The selection and appointment process needs to be such that it promotes independence of judges so appointed. In this regard, basic principles in the independence of judiciary adopted by the 7th UN Congress at the Prevention of Crime and Treatment Offenders held in Milan in 1985 is followed by us. And it says that the person selected for judicial office shall be individuals of integrity, ability, with appropriate training or qualifications in law. Any method of judicial selection shall safeguard against judicial appointments for improper motives. There are certain aspects relating to independence of judiciary in the district courts is what I have dealt in a little bit detail, but I'll skip that, which is, <coughs> I'll just indicate that it's so very important that in one of uh, our recent decisions, we have also held that independence of judiciary is also a form of the basic structure of the constitution. Now coming to judges as such, independence of judiciary does not only mean the creation of an autonomous institution free from control and influence of the executive and legislature, but also includes that judges must be impartial and free from any kind of a pressure in all aspects of adjudication. It means that they must be able to make decisions solely based on law and the facts presented before them without any interference from political, economic or social forces. Judges must be guided by their conscience and their understanding of justice rather than being swayed by popular sentiments or personal biases. Another parameter of public trust in the institution 
an independent judiciary promotes public confidence in the legal system. When people have trust in judiciary, they are more likely to seek justice and have faith in their fairness of outcome. This confidence is essential for social harmony and overall well-being of society. Justice Verma, former Chief Justice, has said, the expectation from the judiciary is indeed very high in view of the nature of the role in the constitution. So in the constitution, the independence of the judiciary is meant to empower it as the guardian of the rule of law. It is not merely for its honor, but essentially to serve the public interest and to preserve the rule of law." Unquote. Yet another aspect is relating to social justice. Each of these highlight and answer the question, why is independence of judiciary important? Furthermore, independence of judiciary is not, is not also just a matter of legal principle. It is a powerful tool that can harness to bring about social justice and equality for the marginalized and upper section of the society. In a country as diverse as India, where inequalities persist based on caste, gender, religion, economic status, and independent judiciary plays a pivotal role in ensuring that the rights and dignity of every individual are protected, regardless of their background and social standing. The judiciary acts as a guardian of justice, standing up for the rights of the oppressed and holding those in power accountable for any injustice inflicted upon them. The judiciary is the door of the people to seek redressal for the violations of their rights and ensure rule of law in society. It provides safe, impartial space, safe and impartial space where their governance can be heard and justice can be impartially delivered. Therefore, an independent judiciary is essential to ensure the protection of rights, provide access to justice, acts as check on power, sets precedence for future cases, and advocates for social, social change. There's also the need for tradition and practices of the judges. Independence of judiciary is not only depend on constitutional or administrative setup of any nation, but it may also get intermingled with traditions and practices of the citizenry at large. In order, to in order to be independent from any external biases and prejudices, a judge must maintain judicial aloofness. At the same time, a judge should also be responsive as well as sensitive to societal needs as well as challenges. Judicial wisdom lies in maintaining a balanced approach in the mind to deliver decisions characterized by independent thinking and uprightness. The definition of judicial temperament is objectivity developing into wisdom. It is a state of mind that is straight and encompasses judges' holistic personality. Such open-mindedness and uprightness cannot exist without ascertaining the suitable conditions that are required for the development of an independent judiciary. This question comes to my mind repeatedly when we say not only me, at the end of the constitutional debate, uh, Ambedkar's uh, famous quotation, however good a constitution may be, it is sure to turn out bad because those who are called to work it happen to be bad. However bad the constitution may be, it may turn out to be good if those who are called to work happen to be good lot. The essence of the statement is, it's not in the written constitution. It's very clear. The essence is in who are manning the constitution. So my question has not got answered till now. Then, if the essence vests in the heart of the persons who are managing, then where is that mechanism or structure indicated in the constitution where people of such nature are forged and made. The constitution is silent on that. And constitution is silent on an aspect which is said by Ambedkar himself that 
it doesn't really work. It won't work if you don't have good people. And you don't need this constitution if you have good people. But where do we focus that? Where do we get that? Where is our investment in identifying an institution where such people are forged? Perhaps in a uh, in Arbindo's book, where he talks about fraternity in detail, which is very distinct from how it is understood in the West, there is perhaps a solution in that. Hmm. And that would require another lecture, Dr. Singh, <laughs> not today. But this is an aspect that we must uh, think about, reflect on. <coughs> and uh, the feeder category for judges is the bar. And uh, retired judges or judges who have opted not to become judges, uh, lawyers who have opted not to become judges, and those who hold public positions should be able to develop and let, the in, let youngsters imbibe that principles of selflessness. The essence of the definition of fraternity is actually selflessness. It, is, uh, it needs to be understood by investing more time on the concept because uh, when we talk about liberty, we are talking about the exercise of the ego of an individual for his freedom. When we talk about equality, we are talking about yet again the ego of an, ego of an individual claiming a right of equality to himself. But when we talk about fraternity, it is not a, a, a feature of expression of self. In fact, it is a process of involution. It's not evolution, it's involution. When you say fraternity, you say my right is not as important to me, but my brother's or my sister's right is equally important to me. So therefore, there is some kind of a relinquishment in that. That's the reason why constitutional vocabulary says fraternity is not enforceable. Obviously, it can't be enforceable because fraternity says give up. Give up not by enforcement, but by your inner volition and by your belief that you are living in the society is far more enduring, much better when you ensure that the rights of your brothers and sisters are equally important or perhaps even better or more important. So you would see the psychology of uh, fraternity when it starts working, which we apply day in and day out in our lives without realizing. We do fraternity actually applies day in and day out when we have to share our, our goods or services with others with whom the relationship that you have is not that of give and take, but just a relationship of love and affection. So that is an essential part of the constitution. It's not a philosophical concept. It's actually a political science concept, but that needs to be expounded. And if we bring that in into the constitution, there will be no conflict of equality and liberty there. Because equality and liberty will be reconciled so easily that uh, you wouldn't really mind a brother or a sister exercising a higher uh, freedom or you will let somebody share and not insist on enforcement of your equality norm under Article 14. And I will now conclude by saying that uh, the question is, why is independence of judiciary important in democracy? I think it's like, uh, why is oxygen important for living? Answer is obvious. Without liberty, there is the independence of judiciary. There is no democracy. Without oxygen, there is no life. I thank one and all, particularly Dr. Singhi, 
uh, the uh, uh, Dr. Alex, uh, sorry for that, Alex Ellis, the High Commissioner, um, and uh, Dynamic uh, Vice Chancellor Raj Kumar, Naveen Jindalji, many of my senior senior members of the bar, Vishin Dave is also here, many members of the bar. Just sickly, so happy that I could see all of you. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Thank you for a wonderfully insightful lecture. I now invite Mr. Avishkar Singh, the advocate, to please present the vote of thanks. Honorable Chief Guest, Honorable Mr. Justice Narsimha, His Excellency, the British High Commissioner of India to India, Mr. Ellis, Mr. Michael Hulgate from the British Council, Dr. Singhvi, Professor Rajkumar, Honorable Judges of the Delhi High Court, the Learned Attorney General of India, the Learned Solicitor General for India, the Learned Additional Solicitor Generals, senior advocates present here in this August gathering, senior members of the bar, distinguished members of the legal fraternity, my dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. I want to sincerely express my gratitude to the esteemed guests on the dais and to each one of you on behalf of the Singhvi Trinity Scholarship Award. It is a proud moment for us as a family to establish this endowment over four years ago and with one of the most prestigious institu educational institutions across the globe. The Scholarship Award is a recognition of the exceptional talent possessed by young deserving individuals, such as one we have here today, and granting them an opportunity at, at a moment in their life when they are most in need of guidance and exposure to hone that talent and make, a significant, make significant contributions and reforms to society. Indeed, by making a real difference. The measure and success of the award lies in the empowerment of bright, undeserving, uh, deserving individuals to pursue their dreams unhindered. Our chief guest, Honorable Justice Nasima, has enthralled and educated the audience with his words of wisdom, which are a testament to his experience as an eminent jurist. When he was called upon to serve his country for an even greater and far-reaching cause, it was a colossal loss to the bar. And I must say from the younger members of the bar, he was, his modesty, pleasant and cheerful nature are a hallmark of his amiable and affable personality. I always remember him willing to offer me valuable guidance in the corridors of the Apex Court with great passion to a somewhat lost junior counsel in my early days. Thank you, Honorable Sir, for inspiring us with your knowledge on the subject. It is possibly shaped by your years of perspiration. A warm thanks to our eminent guests of honor today for their critical reflections, not being from the field of law. <coughs> His Excellency Mr. Ellis and learned Mr. Hulgate, who have sparkled the audience with their perspectives on the bridge between the United Kingdom and India. Seen as a country by, seen as the world, as a cradle of democratic values, where a strong judiciary has stood firmly against all kinds of injustice and with a strong passion for the rule of law. I have seen this from close quarters during my stint there for over six years as a student. The topic today bears extreme significance to every citizen's life, no matter what one's affiliations may be. The burning debate pertains not to the if question, but rather to the how question. How does the system strive to make the institution independent? without coming in conflict with other organs of the state, are questions to which our leaders must proffer practical answers, actionable both in letter and spirit. The answers must be relevant in the Indian context, as we have seen that adopting foreign examples from other countries may not particularly work in our suai generous and unique system. There is no gainsaying in the fact that there is no perfect fit that can, that can uh, work in the Indian context. And there can be several constructive tweaks to the collegium system. Perfection in matters such as the collegium or judicial independence will always be a moving target. 
in my humble independent in humble opinion the independence of the judiciary is largely a cumulative collection of the independence of its individual conscience keepers the judges at the individual level it is a specific personality traits which are the ultimate bulwarks of independence fearlessness unquestionable integrity honor in contributing to society the idea of fraternity as was emphasized by justice narsimhan courage in tough moments compassion job satisfaction the idea of leaving behind a strong legacy and other several other personal traits such as independently proceeding to decide matters i do believe that the litmus test of independence is dependent on the disposition of individuals discharging discharging the duty hence what becomes most important is the selection process and the process of identification on the basis of such qualities the other major dilemma is how much sunlight is too much as independence and accountability go hand in hand judiciary is obviously an institution which cannot be policed in the same way as other pillars of the constitution however that does not mean that in pursuit of either virtue the other can be compromised i will end by quoting two eminent persons the us president andrew jackson in 1822 said all rights secured to the citizens under the constitution are worth nothing and a mere bubble unless guaranteed to them by an independent and virtuous judiciary in the indian context it has been famously said that independence of the judiciary means independence from the executive and the legislature but not independence from accountability maintaining the balance is the key thank you everyone again for gracing this enlightening occasion on a busy working weekday and i thank you very much for all the eminent people here with us today thank you very much